Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is part 15 of Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by author J.H. Allen. In part uh, two of this book, chapter four, the title of the chapter is Vindication of the Personal Promises to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a very interesting book, and in many ways it's going to mimic what will happen to God's people in the book of Revelation. Of course, uh, many in the world, especially the so-called church world, believes that the current occupants over in the Middle East are the recipients of God's promises, but uh, I don't think so. Well, they are going to be recipients of God's promises, as found in Obadiah, but um, not the promises made to Abraham knew. No, no, more like the promises made to Esau, Edom, and uh, yeah, those promises. All right, so this is page 183 of this book and you got to realize this book was written about a hundred years ago so you know history has changed a bit but the message is pretty much still the same so let's get going here before we can gather up even the first link in the chain of history as regards the building and planting which Jeremiah must accomplish, we must take a glance at some of the facts concerning the prophet's own history. We have already noticed that when the Lord was instructing Jeremiah in the work which he was to do, he said to him regarding those that should oppose or fight against him, the Lord said, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee. But Jeremiah seems not to have met with any special opposition until during the reign of Jehoiakim. This was at a time when the Lord commanded him to go into the court of the temple and speak to the people as they gathered from all the cities of Judah to worship. At the same time, he told them to speak all the words which the Lord, uh, which he, the Lord, had commanded him, and to diminish not a word. So, in other words, don't uh, don't leave anything out, and don't soft pedal it. What I tell you to say, say it, as harsh as it may be. Let's continue reading. He was true to God and faithfully delivered the divine message. The message itself was full of mercy and accomplished with a provision that if every man would turn from his evil way, then the Lord would avert the impending calamities which hung over the nation as judgments in the consequence of their numerous and manifold sins. Sounds like modern America today, if you ask me, and the, well, and the Western world, so yeah. Let's keep reading. But it only resulted in the prophets, the false prophets, the priests, and the people gathering themselves into an excited, surging, and howling mob, which made a prisoner of Jeremiah, saying unto him, Thou shalt surely die. You ever heard the expression, if you don't like the message, kill the messenger? Oh, yeah. Later, when the princes of Judah heard these things, they came up to the temple, and in order that they might hear and judge for themselves, Jeremiah was permitted to speak again. This he did, still faithfully giving the unwelcome message of the Lord. In conclusion, he said, 
The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house, the temple, and against this city all the words that ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of all the evil that he hath pronounced against you. As for me, now this is Jeremiah speaking, as for me, behold, I am in your hand, do with me as seemeth good unto you, but know ye for a certain that if ye put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon the city and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth, the Lord has sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. The princes were evidently touched somewhat by this appeal and the people with them. For after this, both princes and people stood against the prophet, prophets and the priests and said, This man is not worthy to die. So a division arose among them, which resulted in Jeremiah being spared for the time and set at liberty. But he continued his earnest expostulations with the people because of their sins and continued just as before his starting annunciations concerning the impending ruin of temple, city, and nation. These truths were so unwelcome and painful for the people to hear that other prophets soon began to appear who uttered contrary predictions, no doubt for the sake of the pop popularity which they should acquire among the people by prophesying the return of peace and prosperity. Uh, Bob's note here. You could turn on TBN. And what do they teach? Peace, prosperity, tithing. Oh yeah, tithe. Send your money to God. Uh, here's our address. And God's going to bless you for sending us money. And uh, yeah. You think TBN would ever preach uh, repentance? Repentance? Turning away from sin, obedience to God? No, 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 no. No, you never hear that stuff. So, you know, there's always going to be false prophets running around. All right, let's keep reading. Hananiah was the name of one of these false prophets. On one occasion, he broke a small wooden yoke which Jeremiah wore upon his neck, which had been put there as an object lesson by divine direction. Um, if you don't, if you've never read the story, let me explain. Uh, what do you do when you, um, back in the old days, they didn't have tractors, so they used oxen and they would put a, a yoke upon them. It's like a collar and they would use that to pull the plow behind the animals. Jeremiah was wearing one of those, telling them that they were going to be like the oxen in captivity in slavery and used as beasts of burden. Um, I'm not sure if he told them of the Babylonians or not. I believe he did. Um, so it was symbolic. You guys are going to be like oxen plowing a field. But the uh, Hananiah, the false prophet, took the yoke and uh, broke it and said, Oh, Jeremiah's telling you guys lies. That ain't going to happen. Hey, we're God's chosen people and God loves us and he's not going to do anything bad to us. You know, the pre-trib rapture, we're, we're out of here. God wouldn't beat up his bride. God loves us. And all that stuff works if you uh, don't bother to read the Bible, you know. Don't read the book of Acts where Stephen gets stoned to death or all the suffering that Paul did or how, um, I think it was Peter and James were killed by Herod, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you know, yeah. They, they must have a different God. 
I don't know. All right, let's keep reading. When this false prophet broke the yoke, he told the people that the Lord said that the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, which was not only upon the neck of Judah, but upon all nations, should be broken within two years. But the Lord spoke to Hananiah through his true prophet, Jeremiah, and told him that because he had made the people trust in a lie, he should die that same year. And the record reads, so Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. And uh, I don't think I'm going to be, uh, I, I don't think anybody should be looking for Hananiah in the kingdom. I think he went to the other place. So, yeah. Shemaniah was another one of those lying prophets who was dealt with in a manner which condemned him and exonerated Jeremiah. But still, Jeremiah's enemies, the priests, false prophets, and certain elders were not at rest, but continued their persecutions until the result was that Jeremiah was thrown into prison. Sounds like uh, Jesus and John the Baptist and the apostles all had very, very similar experiences. What do you say? What do you say? With his liberty thus restricted, he could not publicly deliver his message, so he called Baruch the scribe to his assistance, and he wrote as Jeremiah dictated. This manner was inscribed upon a roll of parchment with the view of having it read to the people in some public and frequented part of the city. The favorable opportunity occurred on the occasion of a great festival, which was a feasting day, and which brought the inhabitants of the land from all parts of Judea together at Jerusalem. On the day of the festival, Baruch took a roll and stationed himself at the entry of the new gate of the temple, and calling upon the people to hear him, began to read. A great concourse of people soon gathered around him who listened, apparently with honest attention. But one of the bystanders, Micaiah, went down into the city to the king's palace and reported to the king's scribes and princes, who were assembled in the council chamber that Baruch had gathered the people together in one of the courts of the temple, and that he was reading to them a discourse on prophecy, which had been written by Jeremiah. Bob's note here. Um, prophets generally generally not always but generally more often than not prophets of the lord uh, did not reach retirement age no they got rid of them you know we don't like the message we're going to kill the messenger and uh, yeah uh jesus had uh, jesus had mentioned a few you know a few things like this too right Let's take a look. All right, let's uh, take a break from the book. I want to read something. Uh, Matthew 21 and verse 23. And when he, Jesus, uh, was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? I can hear them in their mocking voice. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which, if ye tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And 
when you think about it, uh, sometimes in Bible symbolism, Israel and Judah are likened unto sons, and other times they're likened unto a bride, a wife. So, symbolism. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Go, uh, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And if you ask me, this is Israel. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. And this is Judah. Whither of them twain did the will of his father? They said unto him the first, Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots, the tax collectors, the cheating tax collectors, and the, the prostitutes, the whores, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Now here is the parable that I wanted you to take a look at concerning the prophets like Jeremiah. Verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. You know, God. Who's the vineyard? You know, Garden of Eden. Through Adam and Eve and through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel. Which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, digged a wine press in it, and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. So who are the husbandmen? They're the workers in the field that are supposed to be doing God's work, right? Went into a far country. Well, heaven, right? And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. But the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, Jesus, right? Saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husband's men saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. So who are the servants? The prophets and the apostles. Oh, yeah. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, who is Jesus talking to here? He's not talking to the Greeks. He's not talking to the Romans. Yeah. He's talking to the you-know-whos. Verse 43, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Huh. When you read about all those churches in the book of Acts and Paul, you know, Ephesus and Corinth and, uh, you know, those are all churches in Greek cities in Greece. The New Testament was written in Greek. Of course, there are those that will tell you it's not true. 
oh, they'll tell you, oh, no, that's not true. You know. But right here tells you. Jesus says, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. And given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees, uh, not the Romans, and when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Oh, yeah. Tell me that doesn't fit about Jeremiah. So. All right. So. Um, all right. Back to page 186. But one of the bystanders, Micaiah, went down into the city, into the, to the king's palace, and reported to the king's scribes and princes who were assembled in the council chamber that Baruch had gathered the people together in one of the courts of the temple, and that he was reading to them a discourse on prophecy which had been written by Jeremiah. He also told them all he himself had heard as Baruch read the book in the hearing of the people. Uh, this aroused such an intent and anxiety among them that they immediately sent Yehudai, an attendant at the palace, to tell Baruch to come to them and bring the roll with him. As soon as he arrived, they asked him to read what he had written. He did so, and they were evidently much impressed, for the scripture statement is, when they had heard all the words, they were afraid. When they had heard all the words, they were afraid both one and the other. Their fear must have been great because they felt a conviction that these words were from the Lord and that these predictions would surely come to pass. This very fear created in them a tender regard for both Baruch and Jeremiah, for they told him that they would be obliged to report the matter to the king. But they advised Baruch, saying, Go hide thee. Yeah, go, go somewhere and hide yourself. Thou and Jeremiah, and let no man, don't let anyone, know where ye be. When the matter was reported to the king, the subject matter of the book so angered him, so angered him that when he had, only, uh, when he had read only three or four leaves, he took out his penknife and cut the entire roll to pieces and threw it in the fire and then ordered his officers to take Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet, but the Lord hid them. Jeremiah 36 and uh, chapter 36 and verse 26. Yeah, you know what got thrown into the fire? Huh. God's word? Uh, yeah. How about the king? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, from what I understand, um, I haven't checked it out, but somebody did some research, and this king's name was removed from the genealogy of uh, later on. So when you destroy God's word, is your name removed from the book of life? Yeah. Yeah, I did a Bible study on the book of life, having your name blotted out of the book of life. People don't like to blo uh, talk about that. Oh, once saved, always saved. Eternal security. The Bible says that God blots names out of the book of life. Can you imagine that? Your name's in the book of life and your actions are so wicked that the Lord says, I don't want this person in my kingdom and crosses your name out. Takes the eraser and Pen, you know, pencils your name out, you know, erases your name out with pen, the pencil, right? But, uh, oh, it's it's written in ink, Chaplain Bob. Ink's permanent. That's fine. Well, he just takes some more ink and blots your name out. And when the books are opened, 
your name's not in the book of life. It's in the book of the book of damnation. I think there's a book of damnation. You don't want to be there, people. You know, people don't read the Bible. They don't read it. They don't listen. You know, it's so easy to go to work every day and listen to it on whatever, MP3 or CD or, you know, I started listening to it on cassette. Yeah, that was a couple years ago, you know, and I'm working now full time and some overtime. That's why I haven't been, you know, doing Bible studies, but uh, I got it on a USB drive in my truck and I can listen to MP3s and I drive 40, 20, you know, about 20 miles to go to work and back. And uh, that's what I do in the morning. And in the afternoon, I listen to it. So, you know, I think I've bought uh, the entire Bible for about eighty-five dollars, um, and you can you can download it for free. You know, anybody wants copies of it, just write me. Um, palm, like palm tree, beach, uh, Palm Beach. That's the name of our county. Weddings with an S at gmail.com write me i'll send you stuff you know but um uh, yeah you know they don't like they don't like you know they want to hear about the love of jesus but they don't want to hear about judgment upon wickedness jesus told his those that listen to him that except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, the you-know-whos, that you wouldn't make it in. Well, that's the Bob paraphrase, but, you know, we got to be, you, we got to be a lot better than they are. A lot better. Not just a little better. So, yeah, if you wanted a short life, get called into the, ministry of prophecy god's pronouncing judgment upon a wicked nation Ugh. so uh, so all right let's keep reading strange isn't it that they should have jeremiah in prison and yet when they came to look for him he cannot be found Hmm. Yeah. Well, guess what? Um, Peter went to prison and an angel of the Lord dropped the chains from off his whatever feet, hands, legs, whatever, and opened the door of the prison, opened the door and he walked out scot-free and he was living. He was sleeping in between two guards and Herod had the guards put to death for letting him go. They had nothing to do with it. You know, when you work for the devil, <laughs> you get paid. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, the wages of sin is death. Yeah. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. That's the Bob, Bob, Bob paraphrase, right? One thing we do know about this, that the Lord took him, Jeremiah, out of prison to hide him, and that when... He again appeared among men. They did not imprison him on the old charges, for the scripture saith. Now Jeremiah came in and went out among the people, for they had not put him in prison. Meanwhile, King Jehoiakim had received his promised burial, that of an ass drawn and cast outside the gates of Jerusalem, and his dead body, as Jeremiah says, was cast out in the day to the heat, and in the night to the frost. The next time in which we find Jeremiah a prisoner is during the reign of Zedekiah, who, as we have before mentioned, was the prophet's own grandson. At this time, Jeremiah's enemies represented to the king that the predictions which were uttered by the prophet were so gloomy and terrible that they depressed and discouraged the hearts of the people to such an extent that they were weakened in their power to resist and that accordingly 
he must be regarded as a public enemy. So persistently were these claims urged that finally the king gave Jeremiah into the hands of his enemies and told them that they might do to him as they pleased. There was a dungeon in the prison to which there was no access except from above. The bottom was wet and miry and covered with filth and slime. It was the custom to let prisoners down into its gloomy depths and leave them there to starve. Into this filthy dungeon, Jeremiah was cast and was left to die of misery and hunger. But God brought Jeremiah into this world to accomplish a work and for the accomplishment, accomplishment of which he himself has pledged his reputation as God. Consequently, he could not afford to let that man die then and there. Um, little side note here, people. When um, the human body is exposed to wet and mud continually, it uh, your your body will start to grow mold, just like old bread. Uh, during World War I, uh, they dug trenches, you know, interconnecting, uh, you know, like a ditch. And every time it would rain, the water would, you know, build up in the trench, mud. And the soldiers, their feet never dried out. And they had a thing called trench foot where their feet would just basically rot. Yeah, they would rot. And there was more casualties from people getting this trench foot, as they called it, than there was from the bullets and bombs. Yeah, it was horrible. Really horrible. Look it up. I'm not making this stuff up. You know, people think I make this stuff up. Um... You know, I'm, I guess I'm kind of weird because, you know, instead of watching television, I'm doing research and, you know, reading the Bible, looking into history and, you know, what's going on in the news and, you know, people send me stories and what have you. And, you know, I got to kind of sift through it. So, but uh, that was a big, that was a big thing. And here it is, Jeremiah is in this mud pit and Jeremiah knew full well if he was left there he you know he would die so things look pretty bleak for Jeremiah from a human point of view but God had other ideas oh yeah so the Lord began to trouble Zedekiah his heart smote him his fears confronted him, and he trembled with misgiving, lest he had delivered a true prophet of God into the hands of those who he knew would surely put him to death. So he inquired what had been done with the prisoner and learned that he had been practically buried alive. Then with fear, tortured haste, he commanded an officer to take 30 men and get Jeremiah out of that horrible pit before he die. When they went to the dungeon and opened the mouth of it, they found they did, that he had sunk deep into the mire. They threw down some old clothes, which he was to fold and place under his arms and about those parts of the body where the ropes were to pass and where the greatest weight would come in in pulling him out of the mire and up out of the dismal pit. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been rescued, but... Uh, you know, they'll make a, a loop with a rope and you'll put it under your arms and just pull you up. You know, and it's nice to have some uh, clothing so that the rope doesn't just, uh, it spreads the weight around so it doesn't, you know. Uh, after that, Jeremiah had the freedom of the court of the prison and the king secretly sought him and begged him to reveal the truth concerning his own fate and that of the kingdom of Judah. Jeremiah did this faithfully, and the king found out all that he had sought to know, 
which proved to be much more than he cared to learn, especially concerning his own fate. When Jeremiah was shut up in the court of that prison, the word of the Lord came to him for the last time concerning the destruction of the city. At the same time, the promise concerning the preservation of his own life was given and was as follows. But I will deliver thee in that day, saith the Lord, and thou shalt not be given into the hand of the men of whom thou art afraid. For I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword, but thy life shall be for a prey, you know, a booty or a prize, upon thee. And that's in Jeremiah 39, 17 and 18. Jeremiah remained shut up in that prison until the Babylonian forces captured the city, broke down the walls, burned the royal palaces and the houses of the people, thus making the inside of those prison walls the only place of safety in all that city. Think about that. Now, it is a remarkable fact, one well worthy of God and certainly one most worthy of note that the Lord had promised not only that the prophet should be delivered from his enemies among his own people, but also that the enemies of his people should treat him well, and that amidst it all his life should be spared. It is also a remarkable fact that in view of all this, we read, Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzar Adon, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him and look well to him, but do him no harm, but do unto him even as he shall say unto thee. And that's in Jeremiah 39, 11 and 12. The effect of this command from the conquering king was so wonderful in its results, and the result was so absolutely essential in order that Jeremiah might be free to finish his divinely appointed task that we are moved to give this result just as it is recorded in the Word of God. Bob's note here. Do you know that King Nebuchadnezzar was responsible for the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel? Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was gave us the Daniel chapter 4. All right, let's keep reading. And the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said unto him, Behold, I loose thee this day from the chains that were upon thy hand. If it seem good unto thee to come with me unto Babylon, come, and I will look well unto thee. But if it seem ill unto thee to come with me into Babylon, forbear. Behold, all the land is before thee. Whither it seemeth good and convenient for thee to go, thither go. So the captain of the guard gave him victuals, you know, food, and a reward, money, and let him go. Query, where did he go and why? Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Where did Jeremiah go? The Bible is silent on that point. Well, guess what? You got to go to legends and history to find out the rest. Um, the next chapter is coming up. Uh, chapter 5, A Royal Remnant That Escapes. And um, like I say, I haven't read this book in 30 years at least. So um, I don't even remember what it says. But hey, stick with me. We'll find out, won't we? Oh, yeah. All right, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.